uh, Terry asked me just a moment ago what page we're on, and we are on page four. Now, for those of you who mark up your papers and you kind of say, this is where we ended the last time we were together, and you kind of have it marked, and it's really on page five for you, uh, it is true. It was where we ended. But we're going to back up for just a moment, okay? And part of it is because we haven't been together for a while, at least as we've been going through Galatians together. And I sat in my makeshift office today, and I, I, was, um, I was feeling a little discouraged. Uh, discouraged about maybe how we've talked about together this whole issue of works versus grace. Paul has been talking with the Galatian church about how it's confusing to him how they could want to go back to the law, go back to, to the works part of it. After experiencing and knowing what they have matured into, going from children to sons and daughters. And, and because of that discussion that, that I'm now having with you, you're, you're probably thinking, now, where did that, where, when did we talk about that? I don't know if you remember this or not. But I want to talk to you about what this looks like because my concern is, and maybe it's just my, you know, being just really critical about myself. My concern is, is that when we speak about the law and Christ being the fulfillment of the law and how we're not under the law, that there's this idea that somehow the law no longer applies. And almost, it's almost like some people are going to think that pastor's saying, why do we even concern ourselves about, you know, the, the laws and the Ten Commandments and all those things? Why, why are we worried about those things? And the fact of the matter is, they are not to be eliminated. They're not to be ignored. We're just saying that at the end of the day, Christ is the fulfillment of those things. And I, and I read something today that I, and I'm more than happy to give full credit to. I was reading a, a, a commentary today that I thought explained this quite well. So I want to go back to, with you for just a moment before, before we talk the, about the fullness of time. And I want to talk about this example uh, of how we can see it with our, our own eyes and even in our imagination see how this is different and how they, they still go together, that they, they coexist together in a sense. Remember when I told you a while back that the law was kind of like the guardian? You know, the, the, it was a guardian. It was, it was when you were a little one, uh, you were raised by a guardian. Uh, in, in biblical times, in the Old Testament, it could have been a slave that was raising the master's children, which I know that today that picture seems a little strange, but that's the way it would have been. And, and that slave, who is the guardian of the child, would, would discipline the child. The guardian would teach the child. The guardian would make sure that the child was safe. He would do all those things until the time came that that father made the choice that at this point in this child's life, they would move from being a child to a son. From a little child to being a son. So now they move from children to heirs. Because in a sense, when they were children, they had no special privileges whatsoever. There was nothing that was granted to them. There was nothing that was given to them. They were as if they were slaves themselves. But it's when the father made the decision, whatever age of that maturity was, that that child no longer was here as a child. Now they are sons and heirs and experiencing and receiving the privileges that come along with all of those things. Now, as you see that picture of the way that a child was raised in the Old Testament, now you have to almost imagine now the picture of the law. And the picture of the law being the guide or the guardian. And along the way, as a child, that, that guardian or the law points you into the right direction. It, it protects you because of what it is and what it says. It doesn't take you down the wrong path. It's taking you down the right path. But it's a growing path. It is almost like you could describe it this way. If you don't hear anything else that I say tonight, write this down. When you are, as a child, living under the law, you are basically learning your ABCs. That's what you're doing. 
You haven't been able to articulate and put those letters into words yet. You haven't been able to go out to the library, if you will, and, and pick out some great literature that you can read because now you've grown from being a child to an adult and, and you can comprehend all the goodness that is out there and experiencing. That is, folks, what it means to move from just being under the law to maturing and experiencing Christ Jesus. Now imagine for just a moment, just imagine that you've got two people in a library and one person is very, very good at being able to, to articulate and to recite their ABCs and sitting right beside of them, you've got a person who not only know their ABCs, but they can read. Now imagine if that one little child who only knew their ABCs had to try to articulate to explain what Christ has done in their life by only using letters, but not putting letters together into words, but just using letters. Virtually impossible, right? But when you grow to maturity and you put those letters into words, now you begin to understand life in a whole different way. And what Paul's saying to the church of Galatia is, why would you want to, after you've experienced the maturity of moving from a child to an heir, or from a child to a son or daughter, why would you want to leave all of these experiences that you now have to go back to, to live as a child? Now, I know, I thought about this today, and I, and I will say, I, I did give it some thought. There are, th there are times that I've said, man, I wouldn't... There's certain aspects of being a child again that were pretty fun, you know, and I could, I could go back for a little while, but I don't want to go back permanently to being a child again. There are aspects of it that's nice, but definitely I've learned a lot, even though it doesn't always show over the years, and, and I get it. I, the, I, I'm glad that I'm where I am now. I don't want to go back and have to relive the acne and all the other stuff that, you know, you had to go through. I'm grateful that for the maturity that's taken place. But to go back, Paul says, to all of that makes no sense. And for those people who, like the Judaizers, and, and for the false teachers and all the others that are, that are part of this, this feeding this information to the Galatian church, he says this legalistic thing doesn't, it never ever draws people closer to Christ. It only draws people further from Christ. That, that's what legalism does. Uh, experiencing Christ in His grace is what always brings people closer to Him. So, I don't know if I've just muddied the water. I'm looking at some faces, I'm thinking, no, maybe I should have just finished and gone right into page five. But, but I hope that you can understand that what, what Paul's saying is that if you're thinking we just don't have to ever think about the law again, then you're misinterpreting everything that Paul's saying. He said, you, you are thankful for the things you learn as a child, but you're also very grateful that you've come to a place of maturity in Christ Jesus. And that's where you want to be. And that's why he's so upset and so angry in a sense. Uh, and by the way, can I give you a homework assignment real quick? Just to, uh, uh, kind of a, to point out just how uh, adamant Paul is about this. You write down chapter 6 and go back and read chapter 6 on your own. It's not very long. But go back and read chapter 6 and see if there's anything that stands out to you about what Paul has to say about those Judaizers and others who are misleading uh, the Galatian church about his words, something to the effect that goes like this, Oh, how I wish that they would come to the end of themselves. Read chapter 6 and see just how strong Paul's words are regarding what he thinks that they're doing. And that's where we'll pick up in a little while, not next week, not, not in a month, but close, we're, coming, we're getting closer. Okay, page four, does that, does that make some sense to what we're talking about? We're not eliminating, we're not doing away with the law, we're just simply saying that we're growing from maturity, from being a child under the law, to come into a place that now it is because of what Christ has done. And oh, by the way, we are going to say this later tonight, but you know what the law also does? The law also lo causes us to long for that. It doesn't make us happy being where we are. It doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't change us on the inside. 
The law alone does not. It is only through Jesus Christ that we're changed on the inside. That's important to remember. Okay, the fullness of time. I, I, I think I probably killed that bird. Uh, the fullness of time. It's the time that is appointed by the Father. Just as I talked about just a moment ago, right? When the Father decides that a child has moved from a, that of a child to a son, right? As a human father makes that decision, so does the Heavenly Father make that decision too. It was in the fullness of time. It wasn't something that was pushed upon the Father. The Father wasn't told when it was going to happen. It was always, always from the beginning that the Father had it in mind at the perfect time, at the fullness of time. Now, i got to tell you, this is what makes my heart just jump for joy. And I, and I, and I just, I'm always amazed how we look at what's happening in our world and we say, man, do you see what's going on around us? It's just crazy. Why is the Lord allowing those things to happen? And then you say later on, you, can, you sometimes have, not always, but sometimes you have those experiences where you say, aha, that's what happened. That's what God was up to. Well, guess what? God didn't force this upon them, but God was using the Roman Empire to prepare them for just the right time for the arrival of Christ. In His timing, not, not making them, but by their own decisions, making a way that was the right time for the Savior to enter the world. Now, on your paper, page 4, I gave you just a couple of things. I'm going to add to that, though. The first thing is, is that when the Roman civilization has brought peace, which you've heard me talk about the Pax Romana. Remember we talked about that before? It was a period of great peace, a time in which uh, laws and, and, and people's civil rights were protected. Uh, you actually weren't just ramrodded by, you know, those who had higher power. You actually could go to court. <laughs> you could win your case. Uh, people had rights to live in their homes. They weren't just taken away from them willy-nilly. Uh, there was peace during that time. Road systems and, and, and all of those things were, were set in place for people to travel much easier than they ever had been in the past. And so you can imagine how, how, how that made it so much easier for people to, to spread the word you know, about this Jesus and what he has done. Um, the, the Greek civilization brought upon us... Uh, a language that was a common language with Greek and Latin that, that, that was requirement for all people to speak. Maybe it was pushed on people, yes, but, but, it, was, but it was part of, of, of bringing cultures together so that they could communicate with one another. So there was, there was this understanding, if you will. Um, these are all things that I, I think when you stop and you think about it, even, even from the Roman standpoint, this was just a... God setting this whole thing up for, the, for Christ coming into the world. I don't think we can take that for granted. Um, I want to talk about this for just a little bit tonight because this whole thing of him sending his son, we're on page five now. You can turn, This is actually where we should have started tonight, but I just killed 15 minutes of, of nonsense stuff. Uh, it was in that fullness of time that God sent his son. And I... I want to stop and I want to talk about that because um, as I mentioned Sunday morning and I have mentioned it in the past too, I, I, I need to say to you brothers and sisters and I mean this with wholeheartedness. I can't imagine Christ Jesus in all of his perfection still, perf still perfect but leaving heaven and coming into the world for you and for me. And, and if I don't mention any of your names, and I just mention mine, knowing what I would do, knowing how I would fail over and over and over again, that he would still love me enough that he would come into the world to save my sins. I think churches today, not all, but many churches today no longer speak about the cross and they no longer speak about the blood. In fact, there are a lot of churches today, when you walk in, you'll never see a cross. You won't hear the pastor talk about those things. It's almost as if 
we don't want to talk about it as if it's a tragedy. As if it was something that, well, that's the way it, that's the way it turned out, but God still was in control. You know, I could never, I could never imagine a situation where Mel Gibson, for example, who, who directed the movie The Passion, I, I, I'm not here to critique. I got to tell you, just watching it, 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 it caused me to, to think about a, a physical pain, a physical suffering that I can't begin to imagine and what that alone would do to an individual, someone who was fully God but still fully human, that Christ would experience that. But then you eliminate that and you say, now just consider this, that while he hung on the cross, never before in all of eternity would the Father ever turn his, his face away, that Christ would experience that. And on top of that, that he would, be, he would become the sin sacrifice for you and for me. Now, I have read and I have read and I have read commentary upon commentary upon commentary. And there is no way of articulating that. There is no way of explaining what Jesus did for you and for me on the cross. So for me to sit here tonight and try to explain that, I cannot. All I know is, is that just as I said Sunday morning, you pray that there comes that time in each of our lives where we then look at the cross and we say, oh, yeah, it was on that cross that he died for me. It was on that cross that he bled for me. It was on the cross that he took my sins with him. And I am so grateful for that. It is a picture, if you will, also of his humanity. When you think about the expression of being born of a woman, it's just a, an indication, if you will, if you go back and you read Matthew, you go back and you read Isaiah, this was not just a, a happenstance either, because this is all that was predicted in the Old Testament. This is how the Savior of the world was to come into the world. This is the way. And it, and it identifies the identity of Christ being fully God and fully human. What a picture. What a picture of Him relinquishing certain aspects of, his, of, his, of who He is for you and for me. Furthermore, Christ was born under the law as well, just like we are. He kept the law, however, perfectly, unlike us. Secondly, he fulfilled that law because he's the only way that you can move from being immature to mature. And then he finally pays it by a curse that's carried on him. He was made sin for you and for me. A perfect and holy God was made sin for us. And I honestly don't have the capability of explaining that to you. But there are days that when I find myself falling short, man, my heart is broken. And I think, man, he would do that even in my stupidity. He would still die for me. And I suspect that there's probably some of you who are here tonight who can articulate and resonate with that as well. Well, we haven't got to one verse yet, so shall we do that so that we can say we have had Bible study tonight? Let's look at verse 5. Why? To redeem those under the law. The, the law never gives a person God's nature within them. It doesn't do that. But it does reveal the desperate need for God and His nature. You see, the law does just that, right? The law, it is a, it is a, uh, it is a, a teacher, it is a disciplinarian, and it points us, and it points us, and it points us to what we need. But it has never been something that that can resonate inside of us, right? The law doesn't do that. It just points us to what does that relationship. He came to redeem us, those who are under the law. Now let's turn to ver uh, let's turn to page six for just a moment. This is not redemption from the curse of the law, as we see in verses uh, thirteen of chapter three, but from slavery to the entire mosaic system. That's what's happening here. The emphasis is not on the penalty of the law, but on its bondage. You see, that's what the law does. The law keeps us in bondage. It keeps us 
as a child. It doesn't bring us to that place of maturity and the freedom and experiencing all the, the blessings that come from that. No, it just keeps pointing us to that over and over again. That's why when Paul said, where, O oh, death, is your sting? Where, O oh, death, is your power? The, the power of sin is in the law, right? That's, that's the reminder. It points us to the law. It says we can't do it. We can't, we can't achieve it on our own. Oh, but we think through Jesus Christ that we have that hope. That's what Paul's referring to. And since Christ redeemed us and set us free, those who were under the law, why would these Gentiles, right? Why would these Gentiles who, who now have already experienced that freedom now wish to be placed back under it again? That's the struggle that, that, that Paul's having here. And the second thing that he's going to point out is this, is that Christ's incarnation and death secured for the people those that would have their full rights of sons. The adoption of sons is what I like about it when the King James uses this. By the way, if you have your King James Bible, that's what it'll say. The adoption of sons. It means that you're no longer just a, like every other slave. Now you're part of the family. Now you're, now you're an heir. Now you have a purpose and a future. All that enjoyment, all those privileges. It's kind of like the prodigal son who said, hey, I'd like to have my inheritance. And he takes his inheritance and he goes away and he blows it. And he says, you know what, after a little while, I'd be better off being a slave in my father's household than this. And what does the father do when there's repentance? When the son comes, the father is looking in the distance and he's waiting for the son to come back. Can I just tell you, that's a beautiful picture. That's a beautiful picture of what God is doing for you and for me. He's not just got his back turned to you. He's not just waiting for you to knock at the door and him slowly come down the steps making you wait. No, he's looking for you. He's waiting for you. And when he comes home, he, put, he brings out the best. He puts a robe on him and he, and he says, go get the, let's have a feast tonight. And I, I'm sure I can understand, I think you could too, why the older son was looking at the situation saying, why? Why would you do that? I mean, look at me. I've been working hard for you. I, I haven't complained a bit. And he, well, look what you're doing. See, we don't understand the love that God has for you and for me that that all he needs, all he longs for is for you to repent. His purpose has always been. Well, all the enjoyments of a privilege that is given to him, a maturity as a son in a family, uh, to be part of a household again, and to the benefits of, of Christ's redemptive work. That's what it's about. Let's look at verse 6. This is top of page 7. Because you are his sons, and I love this. I, I, I remember a long time ago I had a professor at Bethel College, and he always used, first time I ever really heard anybody use it so regularly. But when he would pray, he, he would pray, Daddy. He always said, Daddy. I always just think, that's such a strange, strange thing. You know, I, I, I never heard it. You know, I, I started at Bethel, I had not been a part of the missionary church very long, and and. I came from a Nazarene background, Alan and Sherry, like you know your dad did. And I never heard anybody in the Nazarene church ever say daddy like that. I, I, didn't, I never heard it. And so it kind of caught me off guard at first. But then I'm, I'm looking at what Paul is saying here, and now it begins to make a whole lot more sense to me, right? Because you are his sons. God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. Do you just hear the richness of that word there? I mean, if you talk about any other religion, there's a standoffishness that you have with everything uh, that is out there that is greater, gods and all those things. But the Father created everything, created you, longs to hear you cry out, Abba, Father. <laughs> God the Father, or Daddy, sent His Son. And He also sent His Spirit. Did you notice that? So do you see the Trinity that's working together there? All of the, because so the full Trinity is involved here in the work of salvation. The Holy Spirit is a gift, right? And that is a gift of God to every believer. Every believer because of sonship. Because of the decision that they make for Jesus Christ. That immediately, it's, no, it's not a second thing. It's a beginning thing. It's what the Holy Spirit does. As soon as you make a decision, as soon as you give your heart to Jesus, the, the Spirit begins to work into your life. Begins to work into my life. No sons or daughters lack the Spirit. <laughs> That's good news. Further, He's present within each of believers' hearts to give evidence to, the, to one position in God's family. 
The Spirit moves the believer to pray to God, and He moves him to address Him as, as Abba, Father. It's kind of like the small child, and I know this is kind of crazy um, for you, and if you ever hear me say this to her, I don't want you to think I'm some kind of little kid or something, but I, I've always called my mom, Mama, and uh, it just feels different when I call her Mama versus calling her Mom or Mother. If you call your mom mother, I, I'm not critiquing you tonight. I'm just saying there is a special, there's this connection of loving them in such a way or calling your dad, daddy. I don't know what that means to you. Maybe it doesn't mean anything to you at all. But there's something precious about hearing a father want to hear you cry out to him like that. It's appropriate in the English word, by the way, with this Abba Father to, to describe it as just that, as, as Daddy. And, and my professor would call him Daddy all the time. And now it makes a lot more sense to me today. And by the way, can I just tell you, in case you're thinking that that's just us, I wrote this down as an afterthought, but it's probably important that you know it too. When Jesus was in the garden and he was crying out to his Father, very same word, Abba, Father, Daddy, is the same phrase that Jesus used in the Garden of Gethsemane. <laughs> so if you're just a little too big for Daddy and, and Mommy or Mama, well, maybe you need to go back, rethink that. And it does, this form of, of the way we speak about Daddy or is a form of intimacy or trust, isn't it? I think that's the way you could explain it. As, as opposed to the, the form of legalism that we, that we often use. Um, I, don't tell, I tell stories about him all the time, and I apologize. I had a spiritual father in my life. His name was John Moran, and during a very difficult time, and I think I can go back now and say that um, if it wasn't for John, um, in that season of life when my dad and I didn't have a relationship, I imagine that my life would have been a lot harder but John became a spiritual father to me. And, and one of the things that I loved about John was that here's a guy who was the former president of the, uh, of, of the of missionary church. You know, he, he had this incredible title. He was very well respected. And, you know, sometimes when you have that kind of title and that respect, it can sometimes go to your head, too. And, and, and unfortunately with John, it didn't go to his head. It went the opposite way. He would, he would almost shun anybody who, who tried to describe him as president or <laughs> or anything like that, or they gave him a doctorate degree. I, I remember this very, <laughs> very well. He was given a, a doctorate degree from Bethel College, and, and, and Retha, his wife, um, had it framed and put it on his wall, and he hated it. <laughs> he absolutely hated it. So when people would call him doctor, he just went nuts. He just didn't like it at all. And I remember, I, I think I told you the story, and if I haven't, it's hard to imagine that I haven't, because 23 years you've heard it all. Um, but I was so scared to meet John for the first time uh, when, I was, when I was coming here to work with him. And, and I told Lena before we walked in the office, I said, what do I call him? And, you know, do I call him, do I call him Dr. Moran? Do I call him President? And she said, I don't know what you call him. And I said, well, I won't mention his name, and I'll just wait and see what he says. And so I slipped up, and I can't remember now, I think I called him President Moran, and all of a sudden, if there was any indication that he wasn't paying attention, as soon as I said that, his eyes perked up and his head went up, and he said, okay, i got to talk to you. And I thought this was the end of our time together, and it was very short-lived. He said, I, 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 my name is John, and you can call me John, and if you must, you can call me Pastor John. But Dave, I need to tell you that if I brought Retha in here right now, she'll tell you that when I get up in the morning, I put my pants on one leg at a time. I am no different than you. So if we're going to work together, you can't, you can't let that be a thing that's going to put a, a wedge between us. Well, I was just trying to respect him. <laughs> and, and, and for him, the full form of legalism and, and, and that stuff just was out his, out his window, wasn't in his wheelhouse. Why do I tell you that? Because I will tell you this, is that sometimes we long for titles and we long for positions 
And as we said Sunday morning, Peter cried out. He said, I am a, a servant and an apostle. He understood where he was in the beginning. He understood what he really truly was. He is a servant. He may be given a title as an apostle, but he's a servant. And you know what? I don't know what your title is. I don't know what you want your title to be. But brothers and sisters, if all we are ever called is just servants of the Almighty God, then I think that's more than sufficient for all of us. Okay, I've got five minutes. And I have a meeting tonight with our deacons and deaconesses, so I do have to stop at, oh, somewhere around 745 or something like that. So <laughs> let, let me conclude with this last verse since we didn't get very far tonight. Look at verse 7 with me. He says, so you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. That is what I was trying to conclude with earlier when I was trying to give another description of this whole issue of moving from a child to being his child, to being an heir of the, our, our Heavenly Father. It's God's family. It's a sonship that carries with it its heirship as well. Okay? All right, we're going to end right there because that's a good place because we transition now into verse 8, uh, and, we've, and we're going to switch gears a little bit. So I think that would be a good place to conclude for tonight. Um, I, I, I sometimes find this to be true, and I hope that it hasn't become a boredom to you. I wanted to save the last couple of minutes just to say this to you. Uh, it seems like that Paul's just going on and on about all this, right? I don't, know, I don't know if you felt that in our time together, but it almost feels like that, man, we've gone through, we've gone through three chapters, now into chapter four, and he's just not letting up. And it almost sounds almost like he's being repetitive. Or if he's not, then the pastor is. One of the two is happening. And, and I just want to say to you, you know, this is why we do it in this form through a Bible study, because what we're seeing is this is what Paul is doing. This is what Paul is saying. And what Paul is saying is that this is a big deal. Now, later on, and I, and I certainly can't get into it tonight, but I do want to say to you that I am so grateful. I'm so grateful that, that we are called the people of the book. Did you know that that's what you are? I, I, I don't know if you know that that's what people call you. But if you come from um, Islam, if you read the Koran, uh, with other names also, whether you are a Jew, a believer, or you are a Christian, you are called the people of the book. Now, I want you to know that when you hear people talk about Islam, they will tell you that it is a book of love. And I will tell you that if you do your research, you will find not one thing that points to love, but you will find many times over Scripture referring to the killing of those people who are the people of the book. Now i got to tell you, I never thought in a million years that I would ever say this. But I kind of like the title that they've given to us. Because brothers and sisters, if there's not anything else that we accomplish, or anything else that we do as a church, for us to be called the people of the book, well, can I tell you, brothers and sisters, I can live with that too. And I say that because this is why Paul is going on about it, and the pastor's not just you know, beating a dead horse. This is important to Paul, and it ought to be important to us. Because though we may not be considering circumcision and things like that, maybe, maybe, maybe you are, I don't know. But if you were, or whatever else form of legalism that you think about, it happens in the church today too. We just do it in different ways. Let us never, never forget why it's so important that we always remember the significance of the cross and what Jesus did on the cross. So when you go into a church and you say, well, is it really a big deal that there's not a cross? Is it really a big deal that you know, we don't always have to talk about the blood, we don't always have to talk about the cross? Well, can I tell you, brothers and sisters, if we're not talking about the cross and we're not talking about the blood, then what do you want to talk about? What are we going to talk about that's going to make any significance in your walk if we don't talk about those things? 
That's why Paul's going on about this. It's that big of a deal. Well, isn't that also the same reason why Peter spent the whole book, 2 Peter, to remind them, to tell them, I'm going to tell you this over and over again because I don't want you to forget. And what he doesn't want you to forget is the significance of the cross. If you have your last opportunity to share something with someone before you leave this world, you know you're going to share something that matters to you. And for Peter, what mattered to Peter was what forever changed Peter. He was that man who said, even if all fall away, not me, Lord. It's you and me, buddy. You and I together. <laughs> or later on when he's questioned about Jesus, I didn't know him. I didn't see him. I wasn't with him. That same person now understands what the cross is all about. It changed Peter. It changes you and me too. Okay. I'm done. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for tonight. And we thank you, Lord, for time together. And Lord, we do ask that even as we leave this place, that Lord, that we don't neglect the main things. And the main things are often the plain things. We can get wrapped up into all the other stuff that's hard to understand. But honestly, at the end of the day, we realize that the plain things are the things that matter the most. And we ought to always remember those things. And maybe sometimes when we have a little extra time, we'll deal with the hard things. But most of the time, Lord, we realize that we don't always have the extra time. So we rely upon and we remember the plain things because they are the main things. And so, Lord, we remember what you did on the cross for us. We remember what that did to change our future, to lead us from being slaves to being heirs, from not having a future to to realizing our future with you. But Lord, that you, through your abundant love, a love that we can't begin to describe, you poured out that by demonstrating your love on Calvary. Lord, as you took on the burden of sin for the whole world. And Lord, for that, we never forget. And we remind ourselves of it over and over again. And we do it because you deserve all the glory for it. We've done nothing to deserve it ourselves. But because of you, we have a future. Lord, we love you. And Lord, we commend the rest of this week to you. And Father, it is in your precious and wonderful name that we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.